also join from everywhere in this discussion. So welcome uh, um, at this uh, Humanitarian Network Partnerships Week uh, event on on to discuss the benefits that 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 can be drawn from the CHS, uh, the uh, Common Humanitarian Standard verification, and how how that can help. Um, uh, meet the needs of donor due diligence, but maybe more importantly, also meet the needs of the organizations, uh, especially the local organizations. My name is Andri van Mens. Uh, I coordinate the humanitarian and health team at the mission of the Netherlands here in Geneva. And uh, I've been asked by Ashkai to uh, moderate the session to be your host, uh, which is uh, an honor. Thank you for that. Uh, I hope I'll um, do a good job. Um, I mean, this is an important topic, uh, obviously, um, uh, for several reasons that we are going to discuss today. Uh, the first of all is that we, we obviously, as a sector, as a humanitarian sector, we agreed at the grand bargain uh, that we would try to diminish administrative uh, uh, burden, uh, but more importantly, that we would also try to uh, empower and, and position uh, local responders. Um, and I guess we can use all the tools that we 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 have at our dis disposition to to further that cause. Um, and and I think what we will hear today is a little bit a, a, an innovative approach to this, and and maybe something that can be taken further. Um, so it would be good to hear your your thoughts on that as well uh, after we hear from the panel. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, Ashkai has developed this practical tool that today will be will be shown and and uh, we'll discuss on that uh, before i go into the the, the substance uh, one household message is that uh, the session is recorded for future information purposes uh, to to also inform those that weren't able to join us today um, the program today uh, will be as follows. Uh, I will um, present the panel briefly, then I will um, let the panelists uh, one by one um, do their expose. And at the end, we will have uh, 30 minutes, uh, or maybe even longer, we'll see, um, for Q&As. Um, in which case, I will take both questions from the floor here, obviously, but also from the people online. Uh, Marina next to me will moderate that and, and so we will also, we're not forgetting the online people, that's uh, what I wanted to say. Um, I think with that I will start to briefly uh, introduce the panelists. I have a little paper here in front of me where I can look a little bit. First next to me, coming from uh, for uh, to us from Berlin is uh, Birgit Spiwak. Um, who is a CHS auditor, uh, also registered with Ashkai, um, and an experienced consultant, trainer, and evaluator uh, in the humanitarian field, um, and uh, especially specializing in quality assurance, transparency, and accountability. Um, I think uh, known to many of you. Um, secondly, we have Pierre, uh, who I think doesn't need introduction, Pierre Hauselman who is the executive director of Ashkai, um, uh, which is, as you know, an NGO that provides uh, independent quality insurance in the humanitarian and development sector. Um, long experience uh, in ethical standard and de development uh, and clarification and, uh, and verification, sorry, certification and verification, and very well uh, versed in the uh, CHS standard, as he was one of the co-moderators um, that uh, moderated the, the writing group that came up with the final um, final version of the CHS standard. Uh, so long experience. Then for the donor perspective, we have uh, Peter Taylor with us who joined us from London. I'm assuming from London, from the UK. Um, uh, he's head of the safeguarding unit at uh, FCDO, uh, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Um, and that, that unit, especially, that's also an important topic, obviously, uh, related to this, especially also focuses on, on preventing uh, sexual exploitation and abuse and, and, and harassment in international development programs. Uh, so that's an important topic also in terms of certification and, and these matters. Um, Peter has uh, 25 years experience in uh, development, uh, uh, international development, so very welcome in this panel as well. And finally, last but not least, 
joining us uh, from Uganda is uh, Rehema Kajungu. Um, she is the deputy country director of TPO Uganda and also a member of the CHS Alliance Board. Um, and she will be able to give us the, the NGO perspective today, um, bringing 22 years of experience in, in development cooperation um, and in humanitarian affairs, especially as a gender specialist. Um, so I, as a representative of the mission of the Netherlands, just wanted to also mention that you have extensive experience also on mental health and psychosocial support, uh, which we believe is an important topic. Um, so with that said, um, I want to turn to the first speaker in our panel, Birgit. Um, you will be setting the stage a little bit uh, by um, showing us a, 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 a concrete example of how the, the certification data can be used for the due diligence assessment of, of major donors, in this case in particular um, DG Echo, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that uh, obviously, as you know, has the framework partnership agreement. And, and the, the question is, how can this contribute to the assessment they do in that uh, framework? So, yeah, I, I guess the question to you is, in, in your experience, uh, how how does that, uh, that certification process using the CHS standard um, already meet those due diligence uh, criteria of, of such a donor as DG Echo, but I guess also broaden? The floor is yours. Thanks, Andre. Does it work? Um, well, um, I was asked a little while ago to um, join this panel to share my experiences of doing a so-called bridge exercise between a CHS initial audit of an NGO and um, a pre-assessment for ECHO, for the FPA. So in 2020, I was tasked by HKI as, a, as an auditor to do an initial audit of Diakonia Sweden. And just as I had re sort of finished with that report, I was asked if I could um, contribute to doing this ECHO pre-assessment report, which ultimately would be produced by PricewaterhouseCooper for Diakonia Sweden. So since I'd just done uh, the initial audit, all my knowledge was fresh and all the findings were there in the initial report. So I was quite happy to take on that task which, if I can bore you with some numbers, meant that looking at the ECHO Exante assessment, they were asking for 17 minimum requirements, 13 additional suitability requirements. All of that, when you look at all the detailed questions, adding up to more than 105 questions that needed to be answered. So quite a lot of detail was required by ECHO. And then I looked at what do I have in our CHS initial audit report. So you all know we have nine commitments, 62 indicators. But when you actually break it down even further, because some of the indicators have sub criteria, we also came up with more than 101 criteria. So the task was to match 105 questions that needed to be answered by ECHO with 101 criteria, sub-criteria, that for which I already had findings in the CHS initial audit report. So that was quite a big task. So how did we do that? We came up with a, a matrix, a bridge system, which gave a score to each of the 105 questions. And the score would rate whether the information could be found directly in the CHS report, that would be given a score of three. So it's an identical match and it was only a question of taking it from one report and putting it into uh, the other report. Or a score of two, the information wasn't there in that detail, but could easily be retrieved from the from all the evidence already gathered or a score of one, where we said the information was not there, but could, with a little bit of extra work and some extra um, scrutiny and review, be easily found. Or a score of zero, where we said this is entirely outside of the scope of what we're doing. 
So a painstakingly a matrix was um, done by Pierre. Speak up. Sorry. So um, this matrix was developed uh, mostly by Pierre, and then I used this to match the two um, sets of data. So all in all, I can safely tell you that of these 105 questions that needed to be answered for ECHO, 80% of that information was readily available in our CHS audit report. 80%. Of that, 40% was identical, and it was only a question of, I'm exaggerating a little, doing a bit of a copy-paste thing. So the information was already collected. The other 40% was we only needed to retrieve a small piece of information from something that I already had gathered. So 80% was there and ready to be used. Now, let me give you an example. Echo was asking to see, for example, was asking, the organization has appropriate and proportionate procedures and controls in place to prevent, report, detect, respond, and report on safeguarding issues and allegations. And that's something we can very um, clearly use CHS report reporting findings for that. Another um, example where uh, was, for example, was Echo was asking whether the organization has mandatory training program for staff on security. Now, we are not checking for mandatory um, training programs, but we do check for security policies, for procedures, for training plans. So the, the little piece of information that was missing was the word mandatory. And that was took me approximately three minutes to find that in the evidence there. So 80% very easily covered. Now, of the remaining 20%, only 4% were completely outside of the scope of what we can do as auditors. So these were particular questions in the areas of finance, budgeting, personnel costs, and things like that. An example, ECHO was wanted to know if there is data consistency between the personnel database and the payroll. Now, this is something which is outside of the scope of what we as CHS auditors do and is not currently foreseen. So 4% currently we do not cover. So when we add all of that together, that leaves us with 16% of 105 questions. And these 16% are basically things that we currently do not cover in our reports, but would be very easy to include. Let me give you an example. Um, one of the questions of ECHO is, they want to have some specific information about the role of the board. Now, this is not something we collect as such in a standardized way, but we do collect information about the board and about the governance structure. So we could easily add these type of questions into our portfolio if we know prior to doing the audit that this is what's been, uh, that would add value to donor requirements. So if we know this beforehand, we can easily add that. So if I sum all of this up, we end up with a situation that with a little bit of extra planning, we come up with a coverage rate of easily 96%. And the remaining 4% were in the case of Diakonia Sweden, easy to be answered by uh, their financial auditing company, PricewaterhouseCooper. So I checked with the organization to ask them, how did they actually rate this experience of me preparing this report for them? and to see how useful it was for them. And they told me that they were very happy with it, that the PricewaterhouseCooper consultant found it very easy to validate my findings because there was a clear audit trail and evidence was provided for each of the findings. Um, they told me that 90 to 95% of the scores that I gave 
the organization for ECHO in the report they agreed with. And um, so the findings were validated. So if I sum this all up, um, and I, I have three takeaway things that I would like to share with you. The first one I think is pretty obvious. Um, if we harmonize more, we are going to save a lot of time and money because we avoid duplications. We don't have to ask the same questions again and again if the information has already been validated by uh, an auditing company. The second um, finding is that a CHS audit is a very rigorous undertaking. And we take a lot of pride in assessing not only policies and procedures of an organization, but we also check practice in the field by talking to communities. So we believe a lot of validity to the findings of any donor diligence system. And the last thing was something that uh, the focal point at Diakonia shared with me by saying that they found it very useful to see the findings from the CHS audit report and the findings from the ECHO assessment and seeing that because the scores matched so well, they could come, with, come up with an integrated improvement plan addressing all the correlated findings and that gave their senior management um, a, a much better basis to make decisions and um, work on the changes needed as pointed out. So all in all, um, a very useful and very interesting experience. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Birgit. Um, in a moment, I will go to Pierre for, for some follow-up thoughts on this, but maybe one question to you on this, because you mentioned the bridge, you also mentioned harmonization. If I understood you correctly, the, the, the essence is in, the, in building the bridge, because we're talking about ECHO now, but we could be talking about another donor with another set of, I mean, not 105 or 107 questions or 95 questions. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess asking the question is answering it, but the crux is in building that bridge and that in itself is might also be a a, um, a labor intense process. Um, yes, you're right. The bridge is is the key to it. It will take a little bit of time to make sure the bridge is accepted by both sides, obviously, and by the sector. But um, I believe we have another example where um, a CHS audit uh, contributed to doing uh, an ECHO pre-assessment and that was accepted by ECHO. So I think that's, that's already working. I think the key is also in ensuring that this is done prior to a CHS audit so that we as auditors know which additional questions we have to add to our 101 or how whatever many questions that they are that we need to answer. So we can integrate them and get that information easily without too much extra effort. Thank you, Birgit. And that's, uh, that's I think, a nice uh, bridge to, to Pierre's uh, introduction, because I think based on this concrete example, um, you can give us some thoughts on what it means in terms of policy, because I, I think we heard several things. We heard about harmonization. We heard about building the bridge and that that's also a, a, a question of, you know, uh, making it fit for purpose for that particular time. And lastly, Birgit also mentioned it's good for the auditor to know in advance that this bridge has to be laid, but that might not always be the case. It might also be something that happens later on. So it, it, it raises the question of how these lessons from the practical case can be translated into sort of a structural uh, approach. and. Um, Curious to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Birgit. Uh, this is actually the third episode of a theme we have brought to this, uh, this, this OCHA uh, weeks. Uh, in 2020, 
we came and we announced that we could do the bridge with ECHO and that it would probably bring uh, a lot of savings, human resources, financial. In 2021, we came here. Actually, we didn't came. It was remotely done, but nevertheless. And we announced we had done it. The example Birgit gave us is one of five that we, we did. Uh, so uh, the bridge is one with the echo requirement and needs to be done only once. It is, if you wish, a certain number of questions added to the normal CHS audit. And, um, and it's valid for all the organizations that are interested in the same due diligence uh, uh, process. We have uh, indeed identified that some of the questions were not in the scope of HKI auditors, but we have built the capacity and we have increased the financial auditing capacity among our auditors, which has indeed allowed us to uh, do the full exercise. For an organization called ACT Church of Sweden, we did the audit, we produced the report for ECHO, ECHO validated this report, and ACT Church of Sweden is a, an ECHO partner. So we, we did the whole, the whole exercise. This confirmed the initial assumptions uh, that huge savings could be made. And honestly, compared to uh, offers that ACT Church of Sweden had, the cost of this exercise was 10% of the uh, of the normal quote following a normal process. Not 10% cheaper, 90% cheaper. The cost was 10% of the offer, and this is something that we have been able to corroborate. This saving in terms of money is also saving in terms of human resources, because it was only one audit and not attending several audits by the organization. So huge game. But today, third episode, is the time to take lessons. And uh, what can be these lessons? Or oh, I could speak two hours probably, even more on that. 10 minutes is going to be short, but First of all, while a CHS is not a due diligence standard, has not been developed for due diligence purposes, because it is a core standard, it forces, as Birgit uh, described, it forces the auditor to look into almost all processes of the organization. And because of that, the information that is useful for uh, a due diligence process is at hand. Again, in the case of uh, ACT Church of Sweden, we did 100% of the full uh, process. Uh, and, and this very aspect is what allows the bridges uh, or combined audits to be done. Then another element is that the credibility of the auditing organization is absolutely fundamental. We can have all the bridges we want if the donor does not believe in the robustness of the assessment, this is not going to simplify anything. So in that sense, the fact that HKI is an accredited organization against ISO, relevant ISO standard, accredited meaning we are ourselves audited year by year for the compliance with professional standards, was allowed us to convince ECHO that the results of the, these audits are actually robust audits. We didn't change one word of the ECHO framework. We produced a report for ECHO that is exactly like ECHO did want it. But only one audit. Then another learning, and that's maybe the key point in all of this, is all this exercise was only possible because ECHO outsources its 
auditing. They do not outsource the decision. So the auditor, in that case, HKI, produced the report. And on the basis of this report, they decide yes or no, we want to work with this organization. But they have outsourced the quality assurance. And this is absolutely key and absolutely independent, uh, fundamental. Because it means that the organization, while maintain the organization, the donor, I mean, while maintaining uh, its own standard, its own due diligence requirements, is trusting that other bodies than itself can do the audit. Uh, of course, they have rules and they have clear indication of what they expect, the quality they expect from the auditing organization. But again, this is why our accreditation was, uh, was important. Fourth, and very closely connected to that, harmonization is extremely important, and we will not discuss that. However, we need to start somewhere because it's complex. And this outsourcing of the capacity assessment is actually the most fundamental aspect. Imagine a situation if all don where all donors would only use one standard for their due diligence uh, processes, but only trust their own quality assurance. It would mean that for each organization that is interested in several uh, donors, they would have as many audit as they have uh, donors, uh, while these audits would be with, uh, with the same standard. But there would be a significant charge of audit, and it would not simplify very much the current situation. However, with uh, this bridge technique, combining audit and being able to do the audit and to have this audit outsourced allows to have this simplification. Again, uh, while, while if we do that is because we want to improve the quality of aid for, uh, for the people, we have to think of these tools and, simplifi and simplification. Uh, in addition, the fact the quality assurance is open also opens it to competition and also allows innovation. The kind of innovation that HKI was able to bring to this process with the savings that come there. Uh, final lesson, but I'm not sure it's a lesson uh, that is only for uh, this exercise of bridging. It's maybe more of uh, the six years of HKI experience, but patience is absolutely key. Things move very slowly. However, they move, they do move, and, and that's the, the good news. Uh, and for example, and, and that's going maybe to be a, a bridge to uh, the next presentation, but because we were able to demonstrate we have the technique, we have the robustness, we can do it, uh, we also have been able to uh, put in place a project that is ongoing and which Peter will describe uh, now, by in which we are doing such a bridge with three donors. That's the ECHO framework, that's the FCDO framework, and that is the DANIDA framework. And we are going not only to go with a, a technique and an instrument that covers the CHS and one donor, but the CHS and three donors. And we do hope that this is going to be the first element, the first step, demonstrating that what we have done with ECHO is not something that you can do once by chance, but it is indeed the result of quite a robust and determined methodology that, is, uh, that can be reproduced. And, Andre, once you have the tool and the method, it's not very difficult to do such a mapping and such, uh, such a, a bridge. For example, in recent discussions, we were curious about the uh, UNICEF 
PSEAH uh, requirements, we did the mapping and found that it was 100% covered by the CHS. Uh, so the bridge is done. With that, I hand over to you. Thank you, Pierre, and um, um, thank you also for providing me with the bridge uh, uh, to, to Peter's presentation because um, you, you said several important things. We, you, you basically said, let's not talk about harmonization, let's talk about what we can in practice do. One of the important things, lessons you mentioned, is that that means donors also need to be um, flexible enough to outsource the, 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 the assessment, uh, let's say. And the certification and uh, the other important thing you said is that at the end that the bridge is there and it exists the mapping can be done um, so that's based on a couple of examples uh, and of the analysis of what came out of the examples but i guess uh, be good to hear from the donor perspective how that then um, meets the needs of of the donor and, and how you believe this can um, um, uh, contribute to diminishing that that administrative burden uh, because as donors we obviously have certain assurances that we need uh, the question is how can we we reduce the burden so over to you peter great thank you very much and really really good to be here thank you very much to um hki for convening this this panel and participants and, and all of you for joining um, this is a really um, key topic for us as a major donor, the UK government, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, uh, where I work. Um, as you heard from Andre's uh, introductions, we I have a particular focus, my work on tackling sexual exploitation, abuse, sexual harassment. Um, but what we're talking about in due diligence uh, is trying to keep people safe from harm um, in terms of the people receiving the aid. Uh, whether it's sexual harm or some other form of harm. Um, and for donors, we need that confidence. We need the confidence in our partners. We, we need all of you who are partners uh, to be able to deliver what we want to deliver using our funding. Um, so it's it's about that. It's about that confidence. It's about managing the risk. We know that the risk, if we're talking about um, sexual exploitation, abuse, sexual harassment, is there. It's real. It happens a lot of the time, too often. So how do we how do we manage that risk? But also we're very conscious of the burdens um, that managing that risk entail for all of the organisations, uh, particularly smaller organisations, perhaps at the end of, of delivery chains. So how do we get that balance between ensuring we're protecting people, we have the confidence, but we're not um, uh, creating uh, too many burdens? I won't go into the detail of the due diligence um, process that the, the UK, the FCDO uses. Some of you will be perhaps painfully familiar with it, um, but uh, I will recognise that it's it's not uh, what you might describe as light touch. Um, but I think and we have very much tightened up um, increased uh, our scrutiny on SEAH in the last five years, I think, for reasons you will all understand. Um, but we want to we want to make it work. And I think the really interesting thing about the um, CHS standard is that you look at the indicators and over a third of the indicators um, relates directly to um, uh, preventing responding to SEAH. So there's a very it's kind of it's it's right there um, uh, throughout it. Um, so we as donors, we spend quite a bit of staff time on due diligence processes. We would like to reduce the amount of time that we spend on due diligence processes. Uh, we would like to reduce the amount of time that all of you uh, spend on due diligence processes, but again, while remaining retaining that confidence and, and ensuring protection. Um, so, look, we've heard already um, from uh, Bigot and um, and Pierre about sort of what the aims are, what what's at stake, what can be gained, and there are some really promising things that are emerging from the work that's being done over the last few years. Um, this hasn't happened overnight. This is something that certainly we from the UK, and we've only been focusing on it really since 2018, but we've been working a lot with HKI and CHS and other donors um, on this. And I think this is 
where we've got to now is the kind of the product of three or four years, probably more of, of work. Um, so, but we really need to make, as has been said, other donors come along, others believe that this is a way forward, um, that this that there are benefits for everyone concerned. So these, these pilots um, to try and work out this bridge, as has been described, are, are really important. And it's so encouraging to hear and what's happened with you know, the European Commission Humanitarian Office, with the ECHO pilot, um, and also with the, the Church of Sweden uh, pilot. So, and, and as Pierre was saying with UNICEF as well, I think, um, I mean, Andre, you were talking about this. We're not just, if, if this is going to work and really deliver the benefits, it's got to be system wide. One of the things that we've been doing in the UK from the UK government for quite a few years since 2018 is trying to kind of catalyze, coordinate, bring the whole sector together where all the donors, all the implementing partners, the United Nations, international financial institutions, private sector, everyone to try and have a kind of shared understanding about what the challenges are, particularly on, on safeguarding um, and to uh, align. And if we can, harmonize as Pierre says um, but let's not underestimate the challenge of fully harmonizing but I think the more we can align um, then the will the the, the greater the, um, the the gains will be so the the pilot that uh, Pierre mentioned um, that we're we're just getting underway um, it will be kind of testing this proposition um, that the CHS plus if you want to call it that so um, what's in the uh, CHS plus some additional audit information required above that for uh, participating donors um, that that if you if you take that and if you certify against that it will give the level of quality assurance including on sexual exploitation abuse and sexual harassment that a much larger group of donors require to enable direct funding um, uh, or at least you know, to provide funding without the additional checks and so reducing duplication and cost. Um, so, um, I mean, I think just to say we've the early uh, signals and signs from an FCDO perspective on the mapping are also very encouraging. As I say, we our due diligence assessments are quite um, well clearly defined uh, that they're, they're quite detailed but again a very high percentage of correlation between what is already happening through the chs hki uh, processes um, but we were we're going to test this um, and that's part of our, the pilot so what we're going to do is not just the theoretical paper testing uh, at sort of uh, headquarters uh, basis but also we're going to carry out the pilot with two um, uh, ngos uh, in in developing countries uh, to actually test this and see whether it works. So there will be one in Bangladesh um, and one in uh, Ethiopia. And um, we, from an FCDO perspective, we're hoping that um, one of our auditors will also participate uh, in, in the work as, a, as an observer to learn from it. So we, we hope that the results from this will be available um, towards the end of our 2022. And then obviously we, we need to take stop take stock of the results um, with uh, with HKI, with um, CHS, with and with the much work, the whole community who's interested in this. I say this is not about a narrow group. We talk very regularly to all other major donors, um, to um, the UN, all implementing partners in, in different ways. And we, we need to try and get behind a much more simplified, clearer system when it comes to, um, to due diligence and um, providing that assurance. It may mean that all of us, and I say that including the UK and the FCDO, that we have to adjust our existing um, requirements and what we have put on paper and what we, we currently ask. I think if this is going to work, um, it will require a bit of flexibility, uh, probably in, in all directions. Um, but uh, so it's it's not going to be something that's going to happen overnight. Um, I think, again, it's going to be we're probably in for another this we're into a new exciting phase after a couple of years of really you know, difficult but really important um, foundation building. We're now into the next phase and we'll, we'll see where we get to in the next um, year or two. But really exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, as a as a, a donor, as a representing a donor who 
does little, I would say, direct funding. I wanted to point out that it's this discussion is also important in terms of what we call the intermediary organizations. I mean, a lot of our donations go to these intermediary organizations and they deal with the same issues uh, because they have to then fund on uh, with that money. So, so in that respect, um, that's also why this is important to, to a donor like us who is more an earmarked uh, larger uh, donations to 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 intermediary organizations maybe maybe uh, uh, if i if if i may uh, um a follow up question because pierre mentioned this this um one of the lessons being that you know donors need to be able to externalize uh, use that word the the assessment uh, you mentioned that you're also looking to see how you can diminish the burden on yourself i mean we will come to speak about how this affects local organizations but from a donor perspective um what are you hoping for in terms of diminishing the the administrative burden on your own on your own audit uh, functions so I think we, so for any partner we want to work with, we carry out quite a thorough due diligence assessments covering uh, a number of areas. Uh, safeguarding is, is one of them, but not the only one. And what we want to be able to do is for our staff to know that they can go to uh, an assessment that has been done through you know, HK and say, okay, I, I know that I can rely on this assessment to give me the confidence that I don't then need to go to the potential partner and ask a whole series of questions and ask for a lot of document. And that is, you know, that is a time intensive process. So that's kind of really what we're talking about is to be able to know that there is uh, a, a system, a process that our teams, because our, it's not just our audit department, it's our program managers who, um, you know, we have hundreds of thousands of live program agreements at any time and signing you know kind of every year so it's um we we need to, we want to be able to reduce that by relying on a system um, that will give us the information and the confidence in set areas that we don't need to ask those questions because they've already been answered and the assessment is robust and up to date thank you very much uh, peter um yeah, then uh, to get a more of a perspective on how this then um, is of benefit to the local organization, um, uh, we turn to Rehema. Um, we heard Peter say, you know, we have to have confidence in, in the organization and the partner organizations uh, based on the assessments. But I think a more important question is how does the certification help your organization to improve its procedures and, and to improve its accountability also to the people you work with. Um, because in the essence, that's what we're talking about um, before we even talking about confidence. So. OK, uh, thanks so much, uh, Andre, and thanks, everyone. Uh, it's an honor for us uh, at TPO to be invited to share our experience of what we've gone through during uh, the independent verification that I've been doing for the last uh, four years. It's exciting to know that actually they're reducing the duration because we have had to go through the whole four years to be where we are. But it's an effort worth uh, going through because uh, we have uh, experienced uh, quite a lot of improvement in our policies, but also uh, procedures. A TPO Uganda is a local organization that is working uh, in Uganda, East Africa. We major in um, psychosocial support, and we've been undergoing independent verification since 2018. We are at the moment going through a bridge uh, audit uh, with uh, an aim of transitioning into the certification. And uh, TPO Uganda has quite a long uh, relationship with the standard because we joined uh, way back before uh, the alliance evolved from HAP and people in aid. So we've been quite around and familiar with the standard. Uh, as a local organization, uh, we decided to take uh, this uh, independent verification and try to get the benefits that come with it. Um, it's 
was a difficult uh, decision because we sat down and said four years. Uh, four years, are we going to still be here by the time the four years come? But but here we are. So we underwent the scheme, the initial audit, and I can testify that it has turned around our systems, procedures, policies, and it has taken our organization to a notch higher. Mm -hmm. We have been able to strengthen our policy environment and evolve policies that we did not have, particularly the safeguarding policies, the SEA policies, the risk management, and others. And the results of uh, these audits on the growth of organization and the quality of work that we do, but also the ability to attract donors have been quite great. When we underwent the initial audit, it identified a number of weaknesses in our systems and the way we were relating with the people that we serve. We thought that we were accountable to the people affected by the crisis, but in actual sense, we were not. We we're not as accountable as we thought. And as a result, we decided to dedicate ourselves to improving the systems, but also consider the people that are affected and the people that we serve to work with them and look at them as, as partners in work that we do. So we opened up our systems, we opened up ourselves to try and involve them in as much work as that we do, not only in implementation of activities, not only consulting them before we start the projects, but also in planning and implementation and developing of particularly the complaints and feedback mechanism that the initial audit are found to be one of our weak areas. The people that we work with know what to expect from us at the moment, they have been empowered, we have empowered them because they know what to hold our staff accountable to and we're being accountable to them. Being accountable to the people that we do, we have experienced a number of achievements from this and we feel that we are trusted by the communities. And this has opened up opportunities for TPO Uganda to take on leadership responsibilities, not only at uh, district levels, but also at the national level. Uh, for example, we have been entrusted by the Ministry of Health to chair and coordinate the working group, the National Working Group for Mental Health and Psychosocial Support. We did that for one year, and when our term ended, we went for the second term and we still got it. And many more achievements in terms of trust from not only the government, but the donors. We have also realized a great improvement in internal quality processes, but also strengthened operational and financial management systems, plus the human resources. And you heard from the auditors, the number of indicators that you go through, the number of questions that you go through are quite, um, are quite many. Um, with improved um, operational systems, we have experienced more trust from the donors, we experienced uh, donor confidence in what we do, and this has consequently in, uh, re, uh, in, uh, translated into increase in the resources that we have received in the last three or so years that we've been doing the audit. We have do 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 donors that have specifically asked for the independent verification audits. Um, donors such as uh, Dutch Relief Alliance, USAID, Penny Appeal, Danish Church Aid, UNHCR, Hilton Foundation, and to some extent ECHO, because we receive money from ECHO. They have all used our independent verification audit reports and shortened their due diligences. So the, the experience and the, what Peter is talking about and PL we are beginning to experience the benefits from it. And um, as an example of increased resource mobilization, we signed up a USAID grant totaling to 20 million US dollars in 2020 as the first ever local prime agency in the country. And this was very big for us because 
uh, as we talk about localization, we were given an opportunity and trusted by your side to take up this big grant and we're sub uh, contracting some other organizations that we're taking charge of. But relatedly, UNHCR has also given us close to three million US dollars um, uh, in 2021 and Danish church aid as well. They've given us 450,000 US dollars for the same period. Um, we have also signed up uh, a new donor, Hilton Foundation, uh, in 2021, and have given us 500,000 US dollars. And this I can say that we attribute it to our verification status. If I can look at the increase in our annual budget, I think I can put it about 40% uh, of the increase for the annual budget for the two years. But uh, importantly as well, we have also registered increased staff motivation and pride, especially when we received the CHS stamp that we proudly put on our website to show that we are complying, complying with uh, the CHS audit requirements. And um, this has had ripple effects on our program performance because the staff are motivated. They are motivated to go there and work and show off and belong to a winning team. And this has subsequently led to donor satisfaction. And we all know when you have a, a, a satisfied donor who is believing in what you do, who is appreciating your work, the effect are that you're able to quickly negotiate for, for more funds. So for us, we have received, we have experienced real achievements in terms of resource mobilization because of um, going through this uh, due diligence. And as I wind up, I would like to encourage any organization, especially the local organization and national organization, to sign up for CHS Alliance as members, but also pick an assessment scheme that uh, suits their situation. We have self-assessment, we have independent verification, we have certification, and um, I'm sure an organization can pick a scheme that is suitable for them. Because the benefits for going through this are quite many. They'll enjoy increased donor confidence, they'll have more funding, they'll have improved internal policies and, and procedures, but also, most importantly, they'll be more accountable to the people that they serve. And um, for any organization, if they have intentions of growing and improving and being accountable to the people that they serve, and then they should consider being members for CHS, but also going through some form of due diligence. I strongly believe that with the efforts that are going on, the different donors are putting their heads together the localization agenda is high up on on agenda. I strongly believe that there is no better time than this for especially the national and local organization to join the CHS Alliance and sign up for the scheme that is suitable for them. And from what Peter mentioned, I think to the donors that might be in this room, but also online, um, the HKI auditors are quite thorough. They are quite detailed. I want to encourage and call upon other donors to believe and trust in what HKI auditors do. They are deep, they are very detailed, and by the time they are done with you, I think you're ready to go. So, <laughs> so I, I think it would be only fair that once you go through that experience, then they shouldn't subject you to another detailed due diligence. <laughs> because that, that is my experience. And I, uh, a focal point person for due diligences, I can uh, testify that um, HKI audits are, are very detailed, a lot more detailed than most uh, donor due diligences. I want to thank you so much for your attention. And if there are any questions, I'm glad to take them. Thank you.
Thank you, Rema, for um, giving us the perspective from a local organization. I think one important takeaway for me is that, you know, so far, and that's maybe a little bit of a tendency we have, especially sitting here in Geneva, we're talking about, you know, confidence of the donor in the organization and et cetera. But actually the lesson you were sharing with us is that most importantly, uh, you know, abiding by the, the humanitarian standard has mostly helped your organization be a better uh, uh, help deliverer for the people uh, you work for. Uh, and and being able to position the organization also as a leader in that respect in your country for for uh, both your government and the people. So I think that's an important lesson. I maybe as a follow up question, you mentioned that you know in the end you said uh, donors please trust the, the the assessment done by by HK. Um, in a way, you already mentioned that some of them are doing because you mentioned uh, funding by Echo, by by Dutch Relief Alliance, by USAID, etc. Where I think you said that they use the the reports that have been produced in in the verification process, uh, it almost sounds like they they did like an on the spot kind of bridging exercise. And and I'm curious to 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 know whether your experience is that they indeed didn't redo everything, but actually built on what was already there and maybe just added their own several questions that they that 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 were important to them. Yeah, thank you, Andre. Uh, from experience is that um, most donors will come with their uh, tools to ask, and I'm sure they, they, they have boxes to tick. But, but, you know, there's a difference between when you're dealing with a, a due diligence team that already has confidence in you than and totally uh, another team that doesn't have confidence in you. So the moment they ask, have you been subjected to uh, due diligence, have you been subjected to any standard accreditation? And we mentioned, yes, we are undergoing an independent verification for CHS. You know, they, 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 they kind of lighten up and it's usually in most cases is ticking off the boxes once they read our audit reports. So they make the, the audit um, exercise a lot lighter and, and, and more, more convenient for us. So it, it, it's kind of lighter, but I think I'm looking forward to the time when once you present your audit report by HK and uh, CHS, they'll ask you a few questions, the bridge audit, and then they let you go. But for now, I think we're yet to get there. But the experience is that it's much lighter and they, they gain a lot of confidence knowing that you're undergoing through that verification. Okay, thank you very much. Um... Time for questions. Um, uh, as I said before, I'll start with questions um, uh, from the room and then we'll also look at the questions uh, online. Um, but please, if there are any questions or comments, um, maybe I can ask you to say who you are and which organization you represent and then if relevant, also maybe who the question is addressed to. I see a hand raised there in the back. Thank you. My name is David Gugebuer. I work for Ocha. Uh, my question is for Peter. So congratulations first to all that is presented. It's very interesting. And as there is this initiative where donors, NGOs and the CHS are speaking together, there is also that other initiative where a little bit in a similar way, the main UN bodies are trying to align to a limited extent in the UN partner portal on the same. How do I register and certify actors? Now it's going through the same gate but still it is it then allows each of the agency to do their own due diligence process so um i'm not sure how much they intend to actually align one day but my question to peter would be is there any hope that these two processes speak to each other someday because it's for the same reasons while what you're doing is so precious and what they do is so precious it's still about the same thing so can we hope one day that this hk certification allowing to become a eco partner allows to become a UNICEF partner. Thank you. Peter, go ahead. Um, yeah, that, that is my dream. Um, so yes, absolutely, it would be, it would be fantastic. Um, and I think this is why um, what we're trying to do is, is in this area on due diligence, but not just on everything. I mean, I'm speaking from a very narrow perspective of 
tackling sexual exploitation, abuse, sexual harassment. Um, but I, I think we, everything we're trying to do is to come up with, a, if you like, a, a global approach that all major actors can use and get behind. And part of that would be, um, I mean, we're doing it in other areas. Let me give you another example. We're doing it in other areas, like on the employment cycle, so screening of workers. So, you know, the UN, as you will know, has its clear check system. The sector, large parts of the sector are using the misconduct disclosure scheme. Um, we're funding work through Interpol. There's there are various things going on. We want to bring it all together so that, it, that all the different things at least talk to each other so that if um, any UN organisation has done its partner assessment, that all other UN agencies would use that and not repeat. Um, and then similarly, that if that's accessible and used, um, it could be used by other donors. I mean, we uh, in the UK as FCDO, we will, as part of our due diligence assessment, accept, say to partners who we're, we're assessing, if you've got some assessment that you've done for somebody else and you're willing, you're able and willing to share it with us, do. And we'll look at that and maybe that will provide, you know, enough assurance. But we want to go a step further than that through the, the, the stuff that we're doing. So, yes, ab absolutely. We want to um, be able to do that. And we are. We're in conversation with the UN, um, with others, other donors, with uh, others to to try and work out in general terms right across all work on safeguarding, but including on and thinking about due diligence, how that that might work. Those bridges, not just between donors, but I guess in this context, you know, in many ways, the UN is a donor. It's kind of, I mean, as Andrew was saying, it's kind of well, what what tier, what level down are you going with the funding? Um, but I think uh, it, there are there are so many parallel similarities that we absolutely need to try and uh, bring this all together. Thanks. Pierre, you want to? Yes, I would like to come in. Uh, the short answer would be they do, or more precisely, we do. We, we, do, we do talk with the UN processes. Uh, you may know that UNICEF went uh, benchmarking with this one form of external verification uh, against the CHS, and we have informal discussions. Uh, these informal discussions are on the basis that there is absolutely technically no reason this would not happen. However, we all know that the technique is not the only uh, element in game there. So uh, I, th this is the beginning of a discussion. And I know also that CHS Alliance has a many discussion with the UN system going in the same direction. However, this is less focused and concrete than what we described uh, today, uh, because we, we have concrete examples. But it is starting to happen. Thank you, Pierre. Um, other questions from the room? I saw there, there's a gentleman there. Thank you, uh, Vincent Henson from uh, Start Network. Right, hi, Bridget. Right, so uh, actually, yeah, so first congratulations to the team for the amazing work that you're doing. Uh, I yeah, so we are we're actually we've been working with CHS for some time with the you know with uh, with CHS Alliance and HKI. I believe we've done the mapping as well of uh, Start Network's due diligence against uh, the CHS framework, and so um, that has resulted in great work. And um, we are actually in the process of looking at the verification side of that now with our members, with uh, with members who are with Start Network members that actually hold the CHS certification. So. Um, um, now, anyway, you know that I'm very, uh, very much in, uh, uh, curious about this uh, due diligence pro process, and we're actually run, running another sh uh, session later this afternoon on this. So I wanted to check with you with regard to the bridge tool itself uh, and the pilot with Echo FCDO and, and Danida. Um, I suppose that the one would be that it's actually, um, you know, you have actually mapped it out, you know, before the actual uh, collection of data, right? Um, so has have there been any issues in terms of like alignment, in terms of like the different frameworks of those donors that actually then makes it difficult to actually uh, ask the questions in that particular way or complicates it? Um, maybe what are the challenges essentially with that sort of like three-way mapping that you've done? 
and third and the second question is actually post is it possible to actually do like a post facto bridge to you know use a bridge tool post facto like okay you've done the you know uh, echo fcdo and that, and Danida one and then later on another donor comes along but the information has already been collected right is it possible to use the tool post facto okay that's all thank you thank you very much Birgit I think that was a question for you and maybe for Pierre after um I think the essence of the question was what happens when you have to build three bridges instead of one I don't know maybe that's a question that Peter can answer better than I can um I mean, because you're in the process of doing that. Yeah, right? in the process. I mean, I think Pierre may want to say something about this as well. But I think um, your first question: Do you do you map for you being the work? Yes, absolutely. Um, any challenges? Um, again, Pierre, you will know the detail of this better than me. But I think nothing insurmountable. I think is where we've got to so far. But as I say, the the that mapping isn't complete yet. So, but where the all the signs are that are encouraging and promising and the third one can you kind of apply it retrospectively could you use it could others use it i don't see any reason why not um but it would it would i guess rely on another donor being willing to use the existing bridge i guess if you like that they feel that it is close enough to their requirements does that but i pierre i don't know if you want to come in on any of that pierre interesting question indeed uh, I like what you said, Peter. Nothing is insurmountable. If you want to find a solution, you find it. The question is whether you want to indeed to find it. And, and, and this is the one that is impossible to answer. But if you have the wish, yes, it can be done. Why can it be done? Because we are speaking of processes that overall go in the same direction. There is the same intent and we, we, we could, it's not very politically correct, but we can, we can speak from the part of the organization of downwards and upwards accountability. And, and these are connected. So we can, we, we, we can do this mapping, these bridges with three uh, or more donors. This is what we are going to test. However, the, pro the, the project is ongoing. So please come to our uh, October roundtable. You will have information on that. But uh, we, we bet and we are quite sure we can. Uh, there are differences between donors. For example, we have already identified that the ECHO approach is more of a tick box exercise. So there is one level of uh, compatibility. Uh, but we really need to tick the boxes. The FCDO approach is much more analytical. So it is more compatible with the CHS approach. So we have a higher level of compatibility. But at the end of the day, uh, this means we, we can find a common ground, if only by our going for the most, uh, the most uh, demanding processes that's going to cover the other ones. We can do this afterwards if we have the information. So we are at HK thinking in uh, collecting this information from the beginning, from the start of the audit for the organization that are working with us, with our partners. We are asking questions to them that are not related to the CHS per se. If only if they are a registered organization, if uh, if they have a local uh, legal entity, because we need to have somebody to have a contract with. So we, we go beyond what is exactly in the in, in the CHS. Uh, if we do not ask the question at the time of the audit, it means if we want to bridge with another processes and we do not have the answer, we need to go back and ask the question and find the answer. But it is possible. In most cases, if we have been thorough enough, uh, we are about to have, and that's what uh, Birgit uh, described, we are going to have easily 80% of the information available and then need to find ways of getting the other 20% if this is done afterwards. That is, of course, more complicated than if we do it at the time of the audit, but it is feasible. 
Thank you, Pierre. Um, have a look at Marina to see if there are. One more question here, OK, and then we'll move to the questions online. OK, thank you very much for this very clear introductions and presentations. My name is Joost Munks. Today I work with the University of Geneva and ICSC, but soon I'll be joining HKI. Very much looking forward to that. I have a series of questions. I'm sure we'll not be able to, to answer them all. Just two questions at this stage. First to you, Brigitte, in terms of when you say 94% is coverage, is covered basically mm -hmm. with the example that you gave. I wonder whether is there any weighing of the criteria or is it sort of basically you look at them and see to what extent they match? Because my guess is that criteria might have different importances uh, in terms of uh, uh, being able to establish such a coverage rate. So that would be the first question to you. The second question would be to Rihima and to, to Peter. You mentioned the idea would be to have a, a systemic change. I mean, in the end, uh, CHS has to become the standard altogether. How can you make that happen? And then to Rihima, what does that mean? Because very rightly pointed out, in the end, it's about helping the people, right? Putting the people at the center. That is the whole idea also of the CHS from what I understand and very nicely represented in this sort of flower of life representation of these nine commitments. So how can you both work towards the populations and at the same time look for a systematic, a systemic change uh, towards CHS? How can we do that? It's a big question, just a few elements. <laughs> Go ahead, Birgit. OK, so um, yes, of course, different um, different audits will have different a different focus and uh, will concentrate on specific aspects more in detail. So the CHS audit, for example, has is very much centered around questions of risk assessment, compliance with feedback and complaint systems. Um, that that's that's a that's a key part of the CHS. And when I was doing the bridge with Echo, I realized that that was covered in a much smaller way by Echo. So Echo didn't have as many questions as we have when we do that. Yeah. Um, and, but the, also the other way around. So, for example, Echo was asking um, in a lot of details around data protection which we don't do as detailed in the CHS, but I believe this is something we can also take on board. We can learn from that and it helps us sharpen our report by looking at what um, a donor requires in terms of data protection, for example. So yes, there's waiting, but at the end, at the end of the day, um, we can still gather all of that information, how that's being used by different donors, what kind of focus they put on that is obviously for them to decide. Um, and then let me let me come to your second one. Yours. Um, so um, I think a lot of it is about signaling from uh, donors. So how do we what are the signals that we're giving about the importance of the CHS standards? Um, so again, from a, it's a, a narrow safeguarding perspective, it's that's why we wrote it into the donor commitments at the 2018 London Summit. That's why it's written into the OECD DAC Development Assistance Committee uh, recommendation with a capital R that uh, the 30 major donors signed up to in 2019. So we are this is we're being really clear in all of our documentation you look at our we pub recently published updated due diligence guidance on safeguarding and again you'll see the mention there of the chs standard but also i mean on your second one around we make giving just as much emphasis to um accountability to affected populations but of course the two are interlinked and if you are meeting the chs principles and and commitments then you will be doing that anyway so um that's that's how we we're trying to do it um through a mixture of signaling and incentives in a in a variety of, of documents and tools thank you peter yeah, yeah, yeah yes yes and for us uh, as you mentioned um 
being accountable to the people that we work with on the ground is, is very important. And when you look at the, the commitments, there's no way escape around it. Um, going through what the commitments require is quite tedious. And at TPO, we've been able to create what we call a CHS accountability team so that it does not only dwell with the focal point person or the senior management, but each one of the staff within TPO knows that they're supposed to be, they're expected to be, you know, accountable to the people that we serve. We have um, complaints and feedback mechanisms in every uh, location where we operate. And um, so this gives an opportunity to the communities to be able to give us feedback where our staff are not being, you know, compliant. And before I uh, wind up, I want to talk about um, our transitioning from independent verification to certification. I'm glad to let you know that we have already been um, accepted to move to the certification process, which is for us um, big and uh, it shows that we've gained confidence over time because Many organizations start with self-assessment, but for us, we've done independent verification, and now we think we are ready to do the certification. And this, in a way, we want to um, sustain what we have benefited, but also to continue excelling in the work that we do, but also being accountable to the people that we serve. Thank you. Thank you, Rehima. Uh... We have been actively looking at the uh, questions uh, online. There's many questions, so very, very good engagement. And thank you for that. Uh, looking at the time, I, I wanted to pick out one question in particular, and I think that maybe, um, well, first goes to you, Rehma, and that's, um, uh, I guess, the question on capacities. I mean, y you mentioned how you hesitated whether to go into this process, uh, whether we will be here in another four years. But I, I, the question is, to what extent can you, do you receive support as a, as a local organization to go through that whole process? Uh, because it, it entails a lot of capacity from you in terms of, uh, of people, but also funding, I would suppose, and, 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 and expertise. Um, so maybe start with you, Rema, on, on, on this question. Um, th thank you, Andre. Yes, I, I entirely agree that for you to be able to go through this process, you need um, some considerable good and technical capacity for you to be able to uh, run through. Um, but there are support systems in place. Uh, the most recent one has been um, a training of focal point persons for CHS uh, that was concluded uh, last week or uh, two weeks back. This, in a way, I think has been extremely helpful because it has unpacked and also helped the focal point person that deal with uh, this verification and audits to not only understand but appreciate what they go through. They have um, equipped the focal point persons with the key skills and tools to be able to negotiate and, and gain support. But also the HKI team, um, I've done and dealt with quite a number of organizations, but I probably haven't worked with a supportive and responsive team like HKI. They are there to r remind you, they are there to uh, nudge you where you're being slow, reminding you about your work plan, reminding you about your deliverables when they are due. So I, I think um, the HKI team is there to support the organizations that go through this reminding you and also available to support you. Many times they write and say, you know what, this is the information, these are the tools, and there are many tools to go through it. But they also make themselves available to support in case you want to make a phone call, in, one, in case you want to do a quick meeting for consultation where need arises. So that has been very helpful for us and, and we are very grateful. Thank you very much. Birgit, as auditor, do you have any thoughts on this and capacities of local organizations when you're auditing them or? I, I think what I would like, what I was wondering is maybe it doesn't answer, but it's a question that I've been having in my in my mind. So here we're talking about 
how do we lessen the burden for us international organizations having to respond to all the donors but what about the local organizations having to respond to the international organizations so let's make sure we also lessen their burden yeah so um when we as auditors come and check how an organization works with their partners we look at partner agreements we look at how they have their due diligence systems in place but let's make sure that we also when they work with a partner that is certified or verified we can also include that into our findings so let's you know do the same maybe andrew i just quick follow on is that um I, I think there are critical issues that need to be factored into especially when you're dealing with auditors, especially context related and culture related. Um, th there are certain things that when you're auditing a national organization and a local organization the, that are not, you know, globally uh, applicable. We had an auditor that came and was asking for, you know, certain elements and certain questions. And here we wonder, well, like, you know, we don't work like this. We work with the local organizations. We work with the local uh, communities, the uh, local governments. And and it was kind of foreign for him. It was very strange. And But we had to sit down and explain and say, you know what, in this country, this is what we work with. So probably the donors that um, have the context and the cultural context in mind. And, and now I think I see the current audit that we're undergoing I see we have someone that is coming from a country that next to us. So if you have a local auditor alongside a global auditor, to be able to bring the perspective, the cultural perspective of the local organization, I think that would be very helpful so that it is not foreign to, to the team, but also the organization. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Birgit and uh, Rema. I think those are important points. I mean, we. We're talking about streamlining and, and reducing administrative burden within keeping with the needs for 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 confidence and 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 um, these kinds of things. But yeah, it's a two way street, I guess, and it's good good to know. It's a two way bridge, I should say. Uh, it's it's good to be aware of that too. That that um, this is to in decrease burden on both uh, sides uh, within keeping with with all the the accountability. Unless there are any final comments or questions, I think we should come to a close. Pierre? I'm sorry, but first I want to build on your on your comment. We need to be absolutely clear that HKI is an audited organization. We cannot provide support for the implementation of the standard. There are other organizations that can do that. The CHS Alliance is one of them. What we can do is help our partners, audited partners, to better integrate the audit mechanism so that they are less of a burden. And that is uh, what we do. And also what we do is that we provide subsidies because uh, financial resources, even if there is a I understand quite an interesting net balance in terms of, of your case. At the beginning, there are uh, significant resources that are needed to initiate these processes. And uh, I want to draw the attention that we have also this uh, facilitation fund that can subsidize uh, local organization, national organization. And if I'm not mistaken, you are one of the beneficiaries. Yeah, uh, we have uh, actually the, the current audit we're getting uh, 90% of the subsidy for meeting the audit fees. So HKI is an NGO. Our purpose is not necessarily, well, we do audit, but because it is a tool to promote the CHS, and we believe the CHS improves for the people. So that that's needs to be really understood. We are talking about due diligence today, but this is because this is a mechanism that goes around, that can facilitate, that can promote. But we want to have improved aid for all the organization. And we are very well aware that national organizations are the immediate responders. And that's why we work quite a lot at this level. 
and then stop here. So Thank you, Pierre. No, I think I think we have to come to a close. I think that's uh, maybe the m most important takeaway is that, uh, you know, we're not doing auditing just for the sake of auditing and, and for the sake of confidence or whatever. We're doing it because the common humanitarian standard is to improve the delivery of aid. Let's uh, let's let's put it that way. And, and that's what we do. What we heard, I think, today is that Notwithstanding, there are all kinds of, you know, administrative hurdles we have to go through when we are auditing. And, and we heard today that there are tools uh, in terms of extended uh, verification assessment that can help to bring different demands from different organizations, donors or intermediaries or even the local organization to bring that together. Um, and I think the message was also that using those tools we can start by doing that in a very practical manner notwithstanding the fact that we then can keep on dreaming as you said peter about you know aligning more and more uh, not to use the word harmonization but I, I think that's the message that let's not talk too much about harmonization let's do it in practice and from that maybe we will grow uh, together so thank you very much uh, for being with us and um, thank you for to Ashkai for organizing uh, this uh, this session. Uh, very important. Thank you for the panelists for being here with us uh, physically as well. And thank you for the people online uh, for joining us. That's it. All right.